we're gonna get started um, this webinar. Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Marcela Gonzalez Rivas. I'm an associate professor at the Graduate School of Public and International Affairs at the University of Pittsburgh, where, where I lead the research working group Closing the Water Gap. We are a group of faculty and students, and we basically do research that focuses on water governance issues like water equity, affordability, and we work with local organizations and community groups on the practical implementation of the human right to water. Um, if you wanna know more about our work, uh, the Twitter handle is in the chat. I wanna start by thanking the Center for Latin American Studies for hosting us today, as well as the Mascaro Center for Sustainability for the support in, in hosting this webinar. And this is the time that I would like to invite everyone to introduce yourselves in the chat. We're very excited uh, to get attention from all of you. We're really, really excited about today's webinar. And the focus, exporting US water pipes and the devastating impacts this has on communities across the world is complex. And as many of you know, will require more than an hour to discuss appropriately, given all its complexity, right? We are so lucky to collaborate with our three guest speakers who have been working on environmental justice, occupational safety, and public health for many years. They will share with us brief information pack presentations that will inspire action to allow space for imagining how we might be acting together on these. We are dedicating the last 20 minutes for a Q&A session. And so I just wanna take a minute before I introduce the guest speakers. Um, and, and I wanna talk about the motivation be behind this webinar. As many of you know, the Pittsburgh Water and Sewer Authority, PWSA, our, way, our main water system in the city, has received national attention and recognition for their hard work on lead prevention. This is in part due to efforts of community groups advocating and raising awareness of lead in water, as well as the leadership of PWSA in working with these groups, right? So many of us in Pittsburgh that are interested in these very important issues were paying clo close attention to the accolades for PWSA last summer. When my mom, who lives in Mexico City, sent me an article from a Spanish newspaper uh, which discussed how the Biden administration historical efforts in cleaning water pipes in the US would entail pollution for many communities in the world since those very removed lead pipes would likely be exported to communities like Mexico and other similar countries. And so that's what we are going to talk about today. We, this double-edged sword, on the one hand, as some of people put it out there, this is an environmental justice victory, right? Because so much attention is being put for this first time on removing lead from water pipes. But at the same time, we have a global environmental injustice, right? So let me introduce the speakers. First, to talk about the environmental justice concern of letting water, we have Taylor Musel, who's a master of social work student at the University of Pittsburgh and member of the research group. Um, talking about exporting lead pipes for recycling, we have Perry Gottesfeld, who's the executive director of Occupational Knowledge International, a San Francisco-based NGO building global capacity to improve public health by reducing exposures to industrial pollutants. And then we shift gears and talk about locally focused, globally minded solutions. And we have Charlotte Brody, who's the vice president of health initiatives at Blue Green Alliance, a collaboration of labor unions and environmental organizations building a clean, thriving, and equitably, equitably economy. And then to talk about the community impacts, we have Sofia Chavez Arce, who is the general director of Casa Sen, a Mexican NGO specializing in environmental health education 
and advocacy. And then, like I said earlier, we have the, the last 20 minutes for the Q&A, which Dr. Kaylin Froring, an assistant professor of global studies at UNC Charlotte, and also a member of the working group, will be moderating. So welcome, everyone. And I turn it to you, Taylor. Thank you, Marcella, for that introduction. Um, again, I'm Taylor. I am a student at University of Pittsburgh. And um, today I'm gonna give a quick overview of the issue of lead and water and why this is an environmental justice concern. Um, as probably most people in this webinar know, um, lead is of course a neurotoxin that has um, really detrimental health impacts. And one of the primary routes of exposure is through drinking water and corroding and deteriorating drinking pipes. And it's also an issue of environmental justice and health equity. Black children are three times as likely to have lead poisoning as um, white children and children living in low income households are twice as likely to have lead poisoning cases. And this is due of course to past and present um, policies that lead to disinvestment um, in our infrastructure, which includes housing and of course our water grid, which leads to deterioration, the creation of lead hazards, and then lead poisoning um, in effect and um, higher cases within um, communities of color and low income communities. Environmental justice, that's a phrase we'll use a lot um, in this webinar, um, refers really to a grassroots global movement um, largely led by people of color and is also a concept that's been used increasingly by institutions such as the United States Environmental Protection Agency. And this is a huge progress. Um, and focus on equity. And their definition, according to what's posted on their website, is that environmental justice is both protecting communities from hazards in their environment that may affect their health, and also having equitable access to the processes through which decisions get made about how healthy communities are created. And one um, you know, huge example of environmental justice commitments by our federal agencies within the US is the 2021 uh, lead pipe and, uh, and paint action plan. And this really launched a series of um, companion um, strategies such as the strategy to reduce lead exposures and disparities within lead prevention programs. Um, efforts such as the lead service line replacement accelerators, which is four states, including our own Pennsylvania, to use infrastructure monies to replace lead pipes and replace them equitably, policy changes to the lead and copper rule, and of course, the historic investments in federal um, and state and local programs for lead service line replacements at $26 billion. Um, and this is a result of incredible collaboration and is inspiring progress on this long-term issue of lead prevention within communities and to bring environmental justice to um, communities within the United States. And here locally, we have benefited from this progress. We uh, replaced our 10,000th lead pipe within um, Pittsburgh just earlier this year, and we want to uplift this progress as Marcella um, highlighted earlier within this webinar. Um, and we also want to ask the question, as was also alluded, where do they go? What will become of these lead pipes as they are removed? And this is a question um, we want to explore, not as a critique um, on the movements and the commitments and the programs that have been underway to ensure that communities within the US are protected from lead, but rather an invitation to say, how can we think and broaden our perspective and the scope of these solutions um, to lead poisoning from a national perspective to a global. And um, this is a question that the um, you know, working group has been examining closely. And as you'll hear today, we have information related to this question and we still have a lot of unanswered questions. And so we invite you to join us after this webinar to continue this work um, to answer this and ensure that um, when we think about environmental justice, we um, work at it from a global perspective. And now I will turn it over to um, our first guest speaker, Perry, who will talk about the exports of lead pipes.
Hello, everybody. Uh, should be able to see my screen now. As noted, I'm Perry Gottesfeld, the Executive Director of Occupational Knowledge International. We're based in the US, but um, our work is almost exclusively in low and middle income countries where we focus on uh, building capacity around occupational environmental health. Uh, currently, the goal in the U.S. is to replace approximately 9.2 million lead service lines over the next decade. Uh, about a dozen years ago, when Lansing, Michigan replaced 7,000 service lines going into homes, they were proud to say they had sent 38 tons of lead pipe for recycling to the local scrap dealer. And the reason is, is that lead has value. Um, even old lead pipes can be sold and uh, these uh, will generate at least a little bit of income for these contractors um, conducting this work. So we estimate that if this program is successful nationally, the uh, lead pipes that will be coming out of the ground will double annual US exports of lead scrap. And the reason is, of course, that this material has value and it is more valuable often in low and middle income countries that don't have lead mining domestically and must import supplies of this essential metal. We know that leaving lead pipes in place and disconnecting them will also pose a long-term hazard for groundwater and soil contamination. Although there has been very little research specifically on the problem with lead pipes being left behind, there's been a lot of research that have looked at lead firing ranges where we have, excuse me, uh, uh, firing ranges where we have lead bullets in the soil. And of course, um, there have been studies about uh, in recently that, that got attention in the Wall Street Journal series about leaving uh, cable, uh, telephone cable in waterways and underground. And over time, these will, of course, uh, break down and contaminate soil and groundwater. And we know that the rate by which this happens will vary by soil chemistry, the soil pH. We know that the use of road salts will accelerate the process and the depth of groundwater in any given area will also vary and uh, in part um, determine how long it takes for these contaminants to spread. So many uh, water utilities now are trying to get away from trenching throughout people's private property to replace these lines. And one of the techniques being used is called the pull-through technique, where a new copper line is being attached to, uh, to the old lead pipe that's then being pulled out of the ground uh, through a hole in the street at the water main. And this could be done with a simple excavator as shown in this diagram. Alternatively, a drilling device can be used to drill a new hole from the street uh, into the attachment to the home and a new copper line can be brought through that. In both cases, you're going to require that at least some small sections of pipe be removed, but the majority of the lead service line may remain in place depending on the specifics of this installation. So we know that whether it's the entire line being removed or sections of the pipes that are going to be cut out and removed, all of that is going to go for recycling. None of this stuff is going to the landfill because of the inherent value in this material. And exported material will often end up in smelters like you see here in this photograph that I took in India. And I point this out because India has over 670 authorized lead recyclers. And most of them are very small and have very inadequate controls, as you could see here. Highly polluting, highly problematic from an environmental and occupational health standpoint. In the past, most of our lead scrap went to Mexico as most of our waste lead batteries are shipped off to Mexico. But the most recent data shows that India is taking almost half of lead scrap that's being exported. The other five top countries are listed here, including South Korea, Pakistan, Malaysia, and Ecuador. But you can see from the list at the bottom of the screen um, with all, all of these countries have weaker 
environmental controls than the US and have way weaker occupational protections for workers in these facilities. And to make matters worse, this is unregulated. That is lead scrap is not considered hazardous as are lead batteries that are being exported. So this could go out without any restrictions, without any notifications. And we know that lead recycling is an extremely hazardous industry in all countries, but we know that it's significantly worse in low and middle income countries, which often have no regulations for airborne lead emissions, no employee exposure standards and very little um, information or concern about the environmental contamination that these plants are creating. The regulations are weak, but enforcement is even weaker and that creates a huge serious global health consequences. And we know that in addition to the neurological deficits that are associated with lead exposure, Almost a million people a year are dying from lead exposure. And this is primarily from the cardiovascular risk inherent with lead exposure as lead is associated with high blood pressure and high rates of heart attack and stroke. So in conclusion, there are no requirements that any agency keep track about where lead pipes are removed and where they're left in place. So at the very basic level, we should be keeping track of this going forward. But we also know that lead pipe replacement will definitely involve the removal of at least sections of lead pipe, and that's gonna go and be sold to scrap dealers who are, going to recycle, who are going to recycle this material abroad because that's where the current demand is for this material. But we know that um, there are public health benefits from reducing lead in US drinking water, that this program is important for that reason. But we also know that these benefits may come at the expense of more serious health implications for communities near recycling facilities of low and middle income countries. But with action now, we're at the early stages here, we can avoid the health and environmental justice implications of exporting this hazard. The bottom line is that we could recycle this material domestically in the 10 or so smelters that are in the US. These, are, uh, these facilities are able to take this removed lead pipe and they can be recycled domestically where we have occupational exposure limits and environmental emissions that are significantly more stringent than in other countries. So with that, I will turn it over to our next speaker. Thank you. Thank you, Perry. I'm Charlotte Brody. I'm the Vice President for Occupational Environmental Health for the Blue Green Alliance. And I wanted to start with this slide. This is from the Tooth Fairy study that was done um, in the neighborhoods around the Exide smelter, now closed uh, in Los Angeles, California. And as Perry said, um, uh, lead smelting is dangerous. It was certainly dangerous to the folks who lived uh, ar around um, the Exide smelter, but but as dangerous as lead smelting is in the United States, it's more dangerous in other countries. And we have an obligation to clean up our own mess. Um, and we have um, some evidence, if you'll go to the next slide, of um, what the Biden-Harris administration is doing that, that suggests that um, uh, we're on the right path uh, and we could make that path even stronger and more protective, both for people in the United States and for people in the global South. Uh, this just came out last week, so I thought I would include it. This is a very important um, outcome of the Biden-Harris administration. It came from a lawsuit published by, uh, uh, filed by Earth Justice on behalf of, I think, eight different uh, EJ and environmental groups. But the result is that um, for the first time, if you'll go to the next slide, uh, lead free is actually going to mean lead free. I, for many years, kept one of these 3M lead check uh, uh, kits on my desk 
because they were used and are still used um, by people thinking that if there's no red, uh, uh, the porringer that they're checking to see if the the um, china set that grandma handed down to them uh, for their babies to uh, eat food from is lead free, and it comes back without uh, a, it comes back without red, and so they think they're safe. But actually, what it means is that there's less than 600 parts per million which is a, a lot of lead. And um, uh, if it's 558, it's going to tell you it's lead free. Uh, and uh, I actually have a colleague who used her grandma's Peter Rabbit um, China set, uh, put it in the microwave to warm the baby food and ended up exposing her child who she thought was safe because she'd used one of these tests. Um, but now, because of the uh, EPA action, lead-free is going to, in time, have to actually mean lead-free, uh, a sign of what can happen uh, uh, in the United States. No, next slide, please. Uh, there's also in the works um, uh, new standards for secondary lead smelters. Um, there are standards now. This uh, proposed rule would make it even stronger. Next slide. And uh, TRI, um, the toxic uh, release inventory, actually in the United States keeps track of where lead is emitted. Most of these are, are not smelters, right? There, as Perry said, there's 10 or so smelters left, but we, we have a system that requires companies that are emitting toxic to, to report on what they've got and to have a plan for making it less every year. Next slide. And OSHA, the Occupational Safety and Health Administration, has rules that are intended to protect workers from lead hazards. And in the Biden-Harris administration, um, they're, they're, we're actually talking about lowering uh, the blood levels of lead that require action in worker exposed workers. Next slide. And so we we need to clean up our own mess, not to export it to countries that that uh, um, while our regulations are far from perfect, they're better than in India's. They're better than in the other countries in which um, we would be exporting lead. And beyond that, it's just um, our responsibility to clean up the messes that we create. Next slide. So how do we do that? Um, I, you know, uh, it, it really is about um, going from the intention to do what's right in taking out a lead service line um, and making the family in that house safer, um, going from the intention to, to recycle properly to actually doing it. And the way to do that, like we do in law, is to make it real. That, that, um, that the agreement with the scrap um, uh, recycler ha has to include where the recycled lead is going. And whether or not we do that with local ordinances or with state laws or with um, waste management rules, there has to be a way in writing to follow the lead when it's pulled when the pipe is pulled from the ground and to follow it so it ends up being recycled in the safest smelter in the United States that we can find. Next slide. This is one of the smelters that um, uh, still is in operation in the United States. It's not great, but it's our job to make it, to make that smelter safer and to make sure that that's where the pipe is going. Thanks. I guess it's my turn. Um, can you see my screen? I hope so. My name is Sofia Chavez, and um, I'm the director of Casa Sim from Mexico. And I'm going to talk a little bit about community impacts of, um, of lead exposure. 
So um, what kind of overseas facility would process pipes from lead recycling? Um, we already saw from Perry's slide um, uh, a, a very um, bad smelter in, in India. But I'm going to talk about Mexico, and you're going to understand why I'm talking about Mexico. Um, OK. You see on my screen, these are two smelters in, in Monterrey. And these facilities recycle used lead acid battery. Batteries from the US, in fact. Um, and these smelters might be close to housing, to playgrounds, and to agriculture fields. Here you can see one of our, um, Luis from our team, and he's gathering some soil samples to test for lead. This is Monterrey again. Monterrey is in the north of Mexico, where most used lead battery smelters are. So why am I talking about batteries if this um, webinar is about lead pipes? Because lead consumption it's 80, it, worldwide, it's 86% for batteries. You can see other uses here, um, but the most part goes to new batteries. So why is Mexico important? So the US is the world's largest exporter of used lead batteries, and guess what? Mexico is a destination for most of them, up to 95% of them. And the reason is that a large proportion of US exports are um, that, that they are shipped to Mexico is the environmental regulations and enforcement, which are less restrictive in our country. In fact, the newest South Carolina facility that Clarius built less than 10 years ago was shut down in 2021 to move operations to Mexico. So um, as you can see in this graph, Whenever there are stringent, more stringent regulations in the US, we have an increase of, of exports for um, lead exports, lead containing products uh, to be recycled in Mexico. You can see the, um, the revised ambient air quality standards in the US once they came into implementation. Uh, we can see a, a, a very big um, shift into more exports to Mexico, more used um, lead acid battery exports to Mexico. And if we compare regulatory standards between the US and Mexico, this is what we found. We find that um, some of the legislation is the same. However, ambient air standards are quite different and occupational standards. Um, we have no standards for blood level, lead level medical removal. That means that if a worker has over 50 micrograms per deciliter in blood, they are not required to be removed from work. And even if we do have some regulations that are the same in the US and Mexico, we have very big enforcement deficiencies. There are no visits from authorities. So in fact, Mexico is much more lax in regulating uh, these emissions. We have um, done some research on this. We have a case study where we measured so uh, lead in soil, we took 28 soil samples, which we collected around contamination, uh, around used lead batteries um, facilities for recycling in um, the vicinity of Monterrey. And we found that 57% of these soil samples exceeded the Mex Mexican standard for industrial areas. Unfortunately, the report did not include um, lead, blood lead levels readings in the vicinity, and there is no available information. So we now did 
prove that um, even if we do have regulations, there is no enforcement because we are um, saying that lead levels in soil are much higher than what they should be. Now, um, how about blood lead levels in children in Mexico compared to the US? We have a national health and nutrition survey, which in its last edition, which was 2022, revealed that the national prevalence of lead poisoning in Mexican children from one to four years of age was 17%, which is approximately 10 times greater than in the US. And uh, Perry, who talked before, before me, um, he did a review summarizing 10 published studies showing that um, blood lead levels are among children living in the proximity of lead battery recycling plants. In a country such as Mexico, averaged 25 micrograms per deciliter, which is just outrageous. So what we want to say is that we really urge US federal, state, and local authorities not to export discarded lead pipes. It's a matter of global environmental and social justice. So if we are trying to keep um, US families safe from lead exposure, we should really strive to have all families all over the world be safe too. And that's it. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you so much, Sophia, and to all of our speakers. Um, it's great to see so many people here today. We have over 50 people attending, which is wonderful. So we're going to hop right into the Q&A. Um, I did just want, this is already in the chat, but also a reminder, this is being recorded. The recording will be sent to everyone who registered and will also be available, I think Manuel said, in about a week on uh, the YouTube channel as well. So I've uh, got quite a few questions here and more coming in. So I'm going to read, uh, and some came in the chat, some came in the q and I'm going to read one at a time. If you can keep answers to under 60 seconds, if that's possible. Um, so the first one, I'm going to start kind of very broad, um, but get us all, I guess, thinking globally, is that it seems to be a challenge to think about things beyond very local terms in the United States. How do you think we can change that mentality to think about justice and environmental justice globally? Whoever wants to take it, any of our panelists. Well, I, I could only respond to say that uh... Clearly, awareness is the first step, and most people are, and even those in water departments are unaware of the fate of used lead pipes. So I think that's the first step for sure. And a lot of education and awareness would be my answer. Thanks. I, I think it's, it's part of the um, larger problem of, um, not seeing what we don't want to see, right? And things that that um, go away, we pretend are away. And so I think storytelling um, is an important part of recognizing um, that there are children in India and children in Mexico who are just as important to someone as our children are to us. And uh, and and creating that um, solidarity, in including recognizing the racism um, that exists in what we think we're throwing away uh, and and uh, and talking about that and addressing it. If, if I can just real quick just say that it's also important to think that even though uh, a lot of advocacy groups and and people working at the very local level, we have to think that we have a very complex economy and that all our actions can be very focused at the very local level, but we belong to a global system of consumption and production. And so we have to be really mindful of that. Anyone else very briefly or 
move on to the next. Move on to the next. Okay, um, thank you for all of those answers. So the next question, this one I think actually was specifically directed at, at Perry, but you know anyone can also jump in. So uh, it says Perry's recommendation of using domestic smelters. Is this an issue of policy or is it possible and practical to identify the destination a recycler utilizes when implementing a local program? Yes, it's definitely a question of policy for starters, because um, first we're calling on water providers to set policies that all of this material that's being removed be recycled in the US. And we asked EPA to make that a grant requirement for this funding, but they came back and refused to do that with uh, really answering a question that wasn't answered. Uh, we didn't ask them to restrict all lead scrap exports, but they came back and said, we're not allowed to restrict all lead scrap exports. No, but that definitely needs to be a policy at the local and state levels. But secondly, of course, uh, this there should be some system for managing this waste, and that means tracking it to its ultimate destination. So they could put in place a program where there is a receipt from the recycler that shows that it's actually reached the US destination, which was intended for this material. So all of that does require local efforts to make it happen. Thanks. I, I would just add to that, that, that it, it should have been something that the EPA put into the um, rules. But even without an EPA rule, uh, a, a local utility can do this, right? That, that contracts cover all kinds of things. I mean, think about prenups, right? People put all kinds of strange um, conditions into contracts. And, um, the utility that is selling um, its scrap to a recycler can add requirements to that contract and adding a requirement that the final destination of the scrap be tracked and verified is, is something that we can do even without EPA, even without a state rule, even without a local ordinance. Okay. Great, yeah, thank you for that. Any Anyone else wanna chime into that question? Um, yes, I want to add that maybe it would also be important for local companies or local uh, contractors to ask to have um, the, the lead pipes that are, lead, lead, um, that are left underground, that they should be mapped so that we know where they are for many years to come. So I'm going to use that as the segue to the next question, uh, which kind of relates to thinking about um, disposal. So the question is, since the lead industry sold and installed lead pipes for decades after they knew that lead water pipes were poisoning the population, those lead companies have some responsibility for dealing with the pipe removal. Um, anyone want to address that. I think this is probably pretty pretty complicated question, especially given that I would imagine a lot of those companies aren't even in existence anymore. <laughs> yeah, I completely agree with the sentiment. Of course, this has also been tried with lead paint companies and it has been successful as a litigation strategy in California, but it's not been successful in most other states. Uh, but certainly, uh, that should be investigated as well. Thank you. Um, anyone else wanna chime into that? Okay, uh, we just got another question that came in, but I think um, I'm gonna actually jump to it right now and then go back to the other one. So the question is for any of the presenters, um, do you think there should be partnership amongst countries uh, amongst countries with infrastructure and capacity um, for the removal of lead products within countries across borders for safe disposal. How can can we do that? Think through this. Pro how could this process be started? So I think well, kind of getting at how we make partnerships. 
Well, uh, first of all, there is a global treaty that addresses hazardous materials. Uh, that's the Basel Convention, but unfortunately the US is not a signer to that uh, treaty. One of the few, very few countries that has not uh, endorsed that, uh, rat ratified that treaty. Uh, that aside though, that wouldn't cover this issue because this is about scrap. And this is again, not regulated as hazardous waste. Um, and there again, uh, yeah, certainly the US could do it domestically, but if you're talking about a small country, I don't know, maybe Jamaica, they may not have the, uh, the resources for a adequate recycler in that country. And then international agreements would kick in about how that material would be handled. There, there are examples from other industries where uh, textiles, for example, where US companies have been required to um, have prohibitions on child labor and uh, uh, rules about working conditions in other countries that are similar to what we have in the United States. So it, it, th there's some precedence for requiring sort of contractually that companies in other countries with weaker standards comply with a set of US standards. I, I'm not sure if the analogy really works for, for lead pipes pulled from the ground in the United States, but it, it, there is some precedence. Anyone else? Sophia? Yes, um, I would like to say something. Mexico is an OECD member, and there, um, there is a belief that OECD countries tend to have stringent environmental legislation, and that um, these kinds of, of products uh, could be sent from one OECD country to another OECD country. Well, for Mexico, it's not the case. Even if we do have some legislations that are equitable to the US, we don't have enforcement. So I would just say, just keep them locally. Do not send them anywhere else. <laughs> just do your job and keep them there. That would be my advice. So I'm gonna use, uh, again, kind of Sophia's point to segue to the next. So we actually have, two somewhat related questions, but one is kind of uh, an individual and then another is more kind of thinking about what like, you know, uh, water authorities can do. So someone asked, you know, how do we correctly dispose of things like lead laced China? I had no idea and we have a set in our family as well. But then kind of on the broader into the specific topic of this webinar, uh, we have a message saying, this is Kate Hollander from the Denver Water Lead Reduction Program. Could you provide resources regarding smelting plants that are working domestically so we could get in contact? Whoever wants to take it. Uh, I, I'm glad to uh, do that, but maybe it's best to do that offline. If you could reach out to me after this, uh, I could put you in touch with people. We have talked to some other domestic recyclers that are willing to take this waste. And and I, I think um, first um, uh, a shout out to the Denver water system that has been doing great lead service line replacement with a lot of public education and healthcare provider education and daycare provider education um, and and uh, and sending out um, uh, pitchers to people uh, to clean their water while the lead service lines are being replaced. So a model program, and this could be added to the model where um, uh, Denver could know which smelter um, uh, they're sending their lead pipe to, and actually maybe even um, however good that smelter is now to ask them to be even better, you know, to, to ask for yearly reports to be sent, to um, do a field trip and go see how they're uh, doing to look at their employee blood lead level, uh, you know, th to to ask the kinds of questions that really um, a system as big as Denver's can, and and um, uh, ask the smelter to step up 
and 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 become a, a, an even better model of how it should be done. Anyone else on this particular question? Or... Okay, so we actually have two questions that um, I think are also somewhat related. So I am going to read them together. So one is as battery technology is quickly moving away from lead acid, if lead is ever successfully removed from potentially toxic context, what do we do with the, the lead that has been used and is no longer needed? Um, and then someone else had a question about, would there be an opportunity to repurpose lead pipes in battery farms to store energy from wind and solar power? So back to you all. Well, uh, certainly uh, all this lead scrap is going to go in the same pot as used lead batteries. And uh, as you saw in the earlier slide from Sophia, about 90% of all global lead consumption goes into making batteries. So yes, those will be used for multiple purposes, including for backup power, for solar and wind. But of course, they're also used in every vehicle, including every electric vehicle manufactured today. And they're used uh, for telecom uh, towers around the world and other purposes. So this is a uh, growth industry, unfortunately, that's going to continue the use of uh, lead for decades ahead. But but I you know I it it's not a different question than what do we do with radioactive waste? You know what do we do with all the mercury that no longer is being used in um, healthcare devices? That 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 um, I I think burying it makes it seem like it's disappeared. Um, so probably not a good idea. And um, you know the 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 first principle of toxic waste disposal is um, everything leaks. Uh, so, so the I, if you put it underground, you can't see if it's leaking. Um, so, I, I, I it, it's what legacy pollution means. It doesn't go away, and we don't have really good ways of dealing with it. I, I think the, the, the. Uh, I remember being in a community where someone suggested it turns into monuments to our own stupidity, uh, of, uh, uh, and and that they should be at every major interstate exchange where we just like load it up above ground where we can see it, where we can measure it for leaks and and use those monuments to remember um, what happens when we don't pay attention to what this to what the science is telling us and um, use things that are too dangerous to use for too long. So I think Charlotte, to that point, unless anyone is really wants to respond to this question, does anyone? I mean, so, I just want to, I just wanted to join in real quick to follow up with what Charlotte is trying to has been pointing at, which is we have to change the way we think of what we consume and the way that our production system globally works, and we have to think about the consequences, and this is where thinking about the life cycle of all the products, the alternative materials, and the, the need to be very conservative about threats and risks and be very, very mindful of that. And, and also who's always affected, right? Environmental justice issues and also globally. And so this is obviously a question for policy, absolutely, but it's also a question for those people really aware that are already working locally to establish connections with other movements that are working elsewhere, right? So that um, building those coalitions and alliances, which makes uh, policies better because there's more push to um, toward that same goal of improving conditions for everybody. And we have to think about, you know, environmental issues are, are not just local, Don't there's no borders. We have to think about them globally. And so it's kind of like, generating those incentives to do that. Great. And I think, so we have we have two questions left and we have eight minutes left. And the two questions seemingly are kind of different, but I actually think they're connected. And I think they're connected to the points that Marcella and Charlotte also just kind of were speaking to. So um, 
we have kind of, it's more a statement, I guess, uh, but that labor union should be consulted on the destination and processing of lead. The health of workers in U.S. will almost inevitably be affected, regardless of U.S. regulations and enforcement. And then there was another question about, um, is lead free really possible? Isn't there some everywhere? Can we only ever achieve lead safe? And so I think these questions are speaking to, we have really toxic materials in, in circulation. Um, and what do we do about that? And how do we do, how do we try to address this in a way that isn't just moving environmental injustice around? So um, in the remaining, you know, seven minutes we have, if each of you really could speak to that in very briefly, um, turn it back over. Well, I, I can address the lead free issue just to be clear in the context of this EPA proposal regarding lowering the lead paint limit. It, it's not uh, intended to make lead paint or, or to make paint lead free. Uh, very important. The standard that we're using dates back from the 70s. It's way too high. It's not based on public health and safety. So the goal that EPA is setting out to address is to reduce that level. But new paints are allowed to have a small amount of lead in them. Currently in the US, it's up to 90 parts per million. But it's important to note that um, some ingredients in paint are minerals come from the earth and will have small lead contaminants in them. So normally uh, lead paint might be some, I mean, excuse me, a new paint may be in the range of one or two or three parts per million lead, very low levels. And that's typically what we find as uh, background levels in, in paint, if you will. Lead free is uh, certainly possible if you're talking about copper lines or some other source, but yeah, uh, often there are contaminants and that's why I think it's important that we get away from that terminology of lead free uh, because it, it really is a disservice. I think we wanna talk about lower le levels of lead and lowering standards, but not necessarily lead free standards. May I add to that? <laughs> I think that what we have to do is to manage hazards the best way possible. We in Mexico have many sources of lead exposure, many starting with um, leaded pottery from which we eat every day. We have paint, we have no um, standard for lead in paint in Mexico. So, um, of course, lead is going to be around, but as far as we can manage to have it be less available, we will be in a better position. I think that's where we should strive to go, not, not be lead free like all over because lead is everywhere by now, at least in Mexico. So we just need to manage the hazard the best way possible. And if we're talking about, about lead pipes, I think that the best way to manage the hazard is to keep them locally and to um, manage them locally. I agree with everything that's um, been said. And I just, um, I think it, it can be easily overwhelming, as we've mentioned, that lead is everywhere and it's a legacy pollutant. And so it will follow us in almost every aspect of our lives to the homes we live in, to the places we play in a playground, to the Tupperware and uh, plateware we use when we eat dinner. Um, but I think that there is hope in reducing reduction and that there is a powerful impact in creating lead safe environments like Sophia was mentioning and prioritizing um, the sources that we know impact um, communities the most. And I think this is also where um, community education and transparency really matters um, because we won't ever get to a point where we can say, Pittsburgh, for example, is lead free, but we can empower people with the information to know where are they most likely to encounter a hazard? Where is something, what is it something with lead that's more contained and less um, contaminating is, and what is a more lead safe environment look like and how can you get there? And that's why it's really important in the water space, for example, that um, we see a lot of transparency around water testing and that um, water testing be available to um, families and households who want to see that um, because without that information, um, it's hard for people and communities to figure out how to reduce exposure. 
Yeah, I would just add to that that um, the the gift of the of the new EPA rule is that you can't say lead free and have five hundred and fifty parts per million in 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 your product, and that matters because while we may never have zero lead in our lives, less is better than more, and having the babies who are born next year have less than the babies born this year is the right path. And so everything we do to get closer to zero, the name of the new FDA program to try to get lead out of the food and the other heavy metals out of the foods that babies eat is the goal that, that um, in both the average blood lead levels in children and in the products that, that expose us to lead, the, the path needs to be lower levels every year. Uh, and uh, the closer we get to zero, the safer we're all gonna be. I have a question for you all, <laughs> if I may. Um, what would be the right way to be able to get to more water, um, water uh, managing um, cities to 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 talk about this problem? How how can we get to 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 these people from the cities in the U.S. to know about this information and do something about it? This is open to anybody who wants to speak, even the public. <laughs> I'm also not sure it, there was a final question that came through in the chat. And I think in some ways it, it actually maybe relates to that question a little bit, Sophia, but we're, we're at time here. So I just wanna thank everyone for being here today, but for anyone who has a few extra minutes and wants to hang around, I think we can, you know, we can continue the, conversation, if anyone wants to try to answer Sophia's question. I'd love to answer that question, but I apologize. I have to go. I have a hard stop. I have to be on another call. So thank you all very much. And thank, thank you, Sharon. Thank, thank you for joining us. Day. Yep. Thank you. I don't know if I have the answer, Sophia, but one of the steps toward that is information transparency, which Taylor was uh, pointing at earlier, but also I think that education and learning more about these things. So uh, in our research group, we learned about these through a newspaper article. And, and then we started looking out and we contacted you and Perry and others that have been working for a long time in, in this area. And so um, I think that the more information and more dif um, distribution of information needs to be out there to make people aware and, and join then groups and organizations that have been working on these issues. Uh, the, uh, the answer that came in the chat just a second ago, I think also addresses it exactly, that there's a couple of uh, associations in the US that have the municipal water systems as members, and certainly they have regular meetings and newsletters and the like. So that, that would be an excellent way to reach out to them to get to a lot of the municipal water agencies uh, more efficiently. We have work to do. <laughs> But uh, really, as I said from the beginning, you know, EPA needs to step up to this as well and not just ignore this issue. And they should be offering guidance and assistance to these water providers about what they should be doing about record keeping and what they should be doing about the ultimate disposal of this material. I think that might be a good place to end us. So again, uh, much thanks to everyone here. We'll be following up with an email. I've probably shared links too many times, but you know how to follow everyone now and get more information. And we look forward to continuing not just the conversation, but putting things right into action. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Cool. Many thanks. <laughs>